I once worked with a lawyer who, in his spare time, did some fairly high-level rugby refereeing. I remember being at a test match where he was one of the touch judges. But he once remarked to me that the toughest refereeing gigs are actually the schoolboy games. And he recounted one occasion when he had such an argumentative parent on the sideline that he had to stop the game, walk over to this parent, take off his whistle and offer it to the parent, who of course didn't want to take over refereeing the match, and after that, he was much more compliant with my friend's decisions. It can be the same way when it comes to God. It's easy to be like the argumentative parent on the sideline, watching the way God runs his world and thinking, I don't agree. Why does God let this bad ruler continue in office? Why does he let a child get cancer? Why did he choose Israel to be his special people while the rest of the world remained in darkness? Why is it that even today so many people are in darkness? And why, oh why, did he insist that his son had to die? Now, if we're a Christian or a, or a genuine seeker, we might be genuinely asking that question, why? We really want to know why God has done the things that he's done. But then if we're not really interested in God, or perhaps even hostile, then we don't even mean it when we ask why. We're just saying, I don't agree. If I were God, I would not have done it that way. The movie Bruce Almighty, made in 2003, explored the idea of God handing over the whistle to someone who he thought could, to someone who thought that they could do a better job of ruling the world than what God was doing. The lead character, named Bruce, was allowed to be God for a day. If I remember correctly, it was only over New York City that this Bruce had authority. God himself, played by Morgan Freeman, kept ruling the rest of the world. Now, one neat little joke that the movie played was that Bruce was given this computer in which he could receive everyone's prayers by email. After looking at one or two of the prayers, he realised he was not going to have time to keep up. And so he simply clicked yes to all the prayers. The problem was that so many people had prayed to win the lottery that the available funds were split too many ways. And so everybody won, but each of them only took home about $7. And this was just one of the chaotic and disappointing results of Bruce being God for the day. Now this movie was not Orthodox Christian doctrine, uh, and so I don't want to suggest that it was, but it, it did at least communicate that you might want to think twice before trying to take over God's job from him. The short book of Jonah from the Old Testament is about a prophet who thought that he knew much better than God. He tried his best to prevent God's plans from coming to pass. Now, of course, he was unsuccessful in stopping God's plans, but God did very kindly take the time to explain to Jonah why God did the things that he did. And that's where the lesson will lie for all of us even though we're not told whether Jonah actually learned his lesson or not. Jonah is the most dysfunctional of all the prophets, but his book starts off just like any other prophet. Jonah chapter 1 verse 1, the word of the Lord came to Jonah. Now the job of a prophet was to convey the word of the Lord to the people. But the first unusual thing for Jonah is that the Lord's message to him was, verse 2, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it. Now the reason that's unusual is because prophets were usually called to go to the people of Israel. Israel were God's special people and they were generally the mission field for prophets. But Nineveh was a foreign city, it was the capital of the Assyrian Empire, and as far as Jonah was concerned, these were not nice people. So Jonah simply got up and went in the opposite direction. 
He went westward, down towards the coast, and he got on a ship to Tarshish, which is Spain. It's an incredibly impulsive thing to do. Israelites were not known for seafaring. So to catch a ship to Spain, well, it's the only time in the Old Testament I can think of that anything like this takes place. So now that Jonah is on the ship, we're going to see him, this man, Jonah, who is a member of God's chosen people, the Israelites, and a prophet at that, we're going to see him amongst pagan sailors who do not know the one true God. And unfortunately, Jonah does not make a good showing. God sent a storm on the sea. All the sailors were afraid and were praying to their gods. Evidently, it was a multicultural crew. There were lots of different gods who were being prayed to. And they were also throwing cargo off the ship. So they were using their religion and their science to try to save themselves from this storm. But Jonah was below deck asleep. They came and woke him up and said, come on, we're all praying. Let's see if your God can help. Eventually they cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah, which caused the whole crew to focus in on this strange foreigner and say to him, who are you? And how is it that you have brought this storm on us? Jonah replied, this is Jonah chapter 1 verse 9, I am a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Well, I'd just like to point out that we shouldn't assume that those who... We shouldn't assume that all those other gods that... The, uh, I'd just like to point out that we shouldn't assume that all those other gods that the pagan sailors were worshipping were gods who claimed to have created the world. There were all sorts of large and small gods who were worshipped in the ancient world, but only the Israelites were bold enough to claim that their god was the god of heaven who made everything. And Jonah was directly disobeying him. Well, somehow, to the sailors, Jonah's story had the ring of truth. And they were terrified. They didn't want to do it, but eventually they had to throw Jonah overboard. And sure enough, the sea grew calm. The sailors looked out on the peaceful waters, and they became deeply afraid. Afraid now, not of the waters themselves, not of the the storm and the possibility of drowning, but of the one with the power over the waters, Yahweh, the God of the Hebrews. Of course, in the same way, 800 years later, a boatload of fishermen on the Sea of Galilee would look out on the peaceful waters and be terrified of the one who sat there in the boat with them who had just commanded the wind and the waves to become God's Son, Jesus Christ. It's not possible to say whether these sailors came to a saving faith in the one true God, but they certainly look better than Jonah at this point, don't they? Jonah, of course, is now in the water, and I guess he must have felt that this was the end of him and that he was getting what he deserved for his reckless disobedience of God's call. But, verse 17, the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah, and he was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Now, I don't think Hebrew even has a word for whale. It's just called a great fish. But I suppose a whale is a fair guess. This is the most famous part of the story, and for many people, it's the only part that they know. It's also given rise to one of the greatest rhymes, I think, in all of songwriting, that song from the Gershwin opera, Porgy and Bess, uh, where he sings of Jonah who lived in the whale. Jonah, he lived in the whale. 
He made up his home in that fish's abdomen. Jonah, he lived in the whale. That's amazing. Home in abdomen. Very good rhyme. But the main thing for us to notice is that sending the fish was God's way of saving Jonah. This fish was a carp of compassion and a marlin of mercy. Jonah did not deserve to be saved, but God saved him. So then, in chapter 2, we read this little psalm, which Jonah prayed to the Lord from inside the belly of the fish, thanking God for rescuing him. Jonah seems to say in the psalm that as his life had been ebbing away, he sent up a prayer to God. It's the first time in the book that Jonah has prayed. It must have been a short, wordless prayer. He was underwater, after all. But straight away, God responded with the salvation of the fish. Everything that Jonah prays in the psalm, in chapter 2, is very good theology. He says in verse 8, that those who cling to worthless idols, to, to statues, to false and counterfeit gods, they will miss out on the love of the one true God. See, when we're in distress, we must call out to the one true God, the one who made the heavens and the earth, the Father of Jesus Christ, and he will hear us. Jonah promises to thank God for the amazing salvation that he sent him. And Jonah seems to have learned his lesson. He says, salvation comes from the Lord, chapter 2, verse 9. Uh, literally, salvation belongs to the Lord. He's saying that the power to give and to save human life is a power that is the property of God. Salvation belongs to the Lord. And it follows from that that God has the right to decide whom he will save. But that implication that God has the right to decide whom he'll save, well, Jonah is not going to be able to live with that, as we'll soon see. You see, the words of his psalm are true about God, but it seems that Jonah's heart is not really with God. In any case, the fish is not impressed. Jonah gives him an upset stomach, and the fish, it says, vomits him onto the dry land. Well, then it comes time for take two of Jonah's mission to Nineveh. Chapter 3, verse 1. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to Nineveh and give them my message. Well, this time, Jonah obeyed and went to Nineveh. Bear in mind, he must have been terrified. These are wicked people, and it's a great city. It's very large. It's, it's a bit hard to know what's meant by three days' journey across, because even Sydney is not that big. But the point is, for Jonah, this was a huge city full of violent people. But he went into the city, and he shouted out that the one true God was going to punish them. Well, here comes the next big surprise. This huge city, full of violent people, actually took notice of God's warning. They put on sackcloth, they called on God for mercy, and they gave up their evil ways in the hope that God might relent. This is a miracle. This is a bigger miracle than anything to do with a fish. This is stubborn human beings actually heeding God's word to turn back to God before it's too late. In chapter 3, verse 10, when God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring upon them the disaster he had threatened. It's wonderful, isn't it? After a false start and a detour, in the fish's belly, Jonah's mission is accomplished. But there's another twist. Chapter 4, verse 1. To Jonah, this seemed very wrong. Literally, it says, this eviled a great evil to Jonah. 
This book is full of greats, you see. There's the great city, the great wind, the great storm, the great fish, and here, the great evil to Jonah was that God had shown mercy. Jonah basically says to God, well, look, I told you so. This is why I wanted to disobey you in the first place, because I knew that you were a compassionate God, and I did not want you to show mercy to those Ninevites. The Lord replied, chapter 4, verse 4, Is it right for you to be angry? Well, no reply from Jonah, but what Jonah did then was to go outside the city of Nineveh and sit down to watch it. I think he must have been still hoping that God would rain down fire and sulfur after all onto Nineveh and destroy it. Well, while Jonah was sitting there in the sun, God caused a plant to grow over his head and give him shade. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. It says in verse 6 that Jonah was happy about this plant that was shading him. But then God sent a worm to wither the plant and an east wind to scorch Jonah's head. And Jonah became so angry about losing the plant that for the second time in the book, he says he wishes he was dead. He was an impulsive person, Jonah, wasn't he? I mean, you know, it, it's just a plant and a, and a case of discomfort in the hot wind. But he is so angry about losing that plant. God's stunt with the plant was, of course, to teach Jonah something. It was to teach Jonah something about compassion. For someone as selfish as Jonah, it, it was going to have to be something pretty close to home to, to get Jonah feeling sorry. But he is capable of feeling sorry. He was concerned about this plant. Yes, of course, for purely selfish reasons, but nevertheless, he was sad that the plant had died. And so God said to him in chapter 4, verse 10, You have been concerned about this plant though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and it died overnight. And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are over 120,000 people who do not know their right hand from their left, and also many cattle? When God says that they don't know their right hand from their left, He's, of course, talking about their spiritual ignorance. These people knew nothing of the one true God. And as a result, they were plowing headlong into destruction. But God is still their maker. Shouldn't he feel compassion for them? Remember, these people are wicked. But shouldn't he feel compassion on them? if they're also ignorant. Ignorance does not excuse wickedness. But ignorance is a reason for God to feel compassion. Thanks to my Bible study group this week, we came to what I think is a really valuable insight. I really think we humans, we can so easily swing from being overly compassionate to being harsh and vindictive, and, and then back again. We are easily swayed by what's on the surface of things. We're easily swayed by our own prejudices and by our feelings. God, though, is not like us. God is not vindictive. He is not prejudiced. God is compassionate, but he is not ruled by his feelings. He chooses how he will use his compassion. And that is why when, when we're tempted to think that we could do a better job than God does of running the world, we should resolve afresh to trust God in the way that he chooses to run his world. Because he is just and he is compassionate. 
But also, let's not forget, he is entitled to rule the world because it's his. Salvation belongs to the Lord, as it says there in chapter 2. Jonah realized that. Salvation is the property of the Lord. God is entitled to save whom he will save and choose whom he will not. We can and must trust that God is the best one to be ruling his universe. But let me add just one further piece to the puzzle. I've been speaking about God's choice, and God's choice is real. He does choose. But please don't worry, or, or, or even worse, please don't try to wriggle out with the excuse that, oh, God hasn't chosen me. Because it doesn't work like that, does it? If you're here today hearing this message, then you have the opportunity to be saved. In Matthew chapter 12, Jesus says about himself that one greater than Jonah is here. Jonah came out of the fish and warned the Ninevites that God's judgment was coming, so turn back to God. And Jesus rose out of the grave to warn the whole world that God's judgment is coming. So turn back to God because the blessings of forgiveness are freely available if you do. So, if you're not a Christian yet, please accept Jesus' warning and turn back to the one true God before it's too late. If you are a Christian, let's not succumb to the temptation to think that we know better than God about how to run things. For a start, he's been very good to us in Christ, hasn't he? But what's more, God is never vindictive. He is not ruled by his feelings. He is just. He is compassionate. And he is entitled to choose how he will run his world. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we praise you because salvation belongs to you. It is your right and your power to save. And Heavenly Father, we thank you for the way you have provided for our salvation through the death and resurrection of your Son. We ask you please to, by your Spirit, enable us to trust you in the way that you run your world, knowing that you are indeed never vindictive, never prejudiced, but rather you are just and compassionate and you choose whom you will save. We praise you for this in your Son's name. Amen.